Good morning. For first time visitors here, my name is Cyrus Waters, one of the many ministers here at Fairview Heights Baptist Church. If you have your Bible, I ask that you turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. There's a Bible in front of you. If you don't have one, it should be on page 1056 in the Bible with the pews. And I ask that you please rise as we stand for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 24. And we're going to start at verse 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And the third day, rise again. And they, they remembered his words. And returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other woman with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense. And they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. May this word really impact our lives. May we really be in awe of the resurrection and what it means to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Whether it is in sports, whether it is in music, in entertainment, in politics, in science, There have been many spectacles, many great, fantastic events, events that change the game, so to speak. Many inventions that revolutionize the way we live just in our daily lives. Think about the fall of the Berlin Wall or think about the Gutenberg printing press where now everyone can read. Everyone has access to literature. You have the Civil War which abolished the slavery here in America. Think about all of the sporting events, all the classic games that Joe Montana had, all those comebacks. Think about the amazing plays Barry Sanders did. When Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson came to the NBA, they did things that no one ever seen before. Think about how Hulk Hogan body slammed Andre the Giant at WrestleMania III. Think about the industrial revolution, or think about the technological and digital revolution, how the internet came on the scene. We can now email people, MySpace came out, and then Facebook, and now we have all these social media platforms today. Think about Apollo 11 in 1969. You had two people walk on the moon, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And then in 1983, there was a TV special called Motown 25, yesterday, today, and forever. And the world got to witness one of the greatest and most difficult dance moves to do, the moonwalk, performed by Michael Jackson. There are many unsung heroes in history. Think about scientists who made these cures for certain sicknesses and diseases. Think about the uh, illustrious buildings that have been made by humans throughout history, the Statue of Liberty, the pyramids in Egypt, the Eiffel Tower, the Empire State Building, the Great Wall of China. All these bear witness to how we as humans are image bearers of God, our creativity, our unique abilities, and our different personalities. And all these events are amazing. Many of them are even useful and entertaining, and some are very important. But there is an event more significant than all of those events, than any event in history. Now, of course, I'm ignorant of a lot of history. I wasn't here over 30 years, okay? But you don't have to be a history major to know this. You don't have to be born over 100 years old to know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest event of all time. And throughout the sermon, I'm going to explain why. 
But the resurrection is essential to the Christian faith. In fact, Christianity is, is born out of the resurrection. Christianity wouldn't exist if there was no resurrection. This is the foundation or the cornerstone of our faith. This is why it is the greatest event of all time, one of them. Without the resurrection, there is no point of being here, no point in having church, no point in proclaiming the gospel, evangelizing, doing ministry. There wouldn't be no point. You might as well just stay home, live our life, eat and drink, be merry, for one of these days we die and perish. But see, that's not why we're here. We're here because the Lord did rise. And we didn't wake up this morning to talk about these other special events. See, we didn't wake up this morning to talk about when sliced bread was invented. You understand? <laughs> we came here to talk about the bread of life, right? Who conquered the grave for us, all right? We didn't come here to talk about when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. As amazing as it is, traffic lights, all right? We came here to talk about the true light, the light of the world, Jesus Christ. You understand? So today, the title of this sermon is called The Greatest Event of All Time. This morning, I'm going to share with you guys three reasons. There's a lot more, but based on this text, three reasons why the resurrection of Christ is the most unique and greatest event of all time. And throughout those three reasons, I want to convince you. If you don't believe this already, I want to convince you. I want to persuade you. I want to press it on your heart that you need the resurrection. I want you to understand the implications and the necessity of the resurrection. I'm not only want you to know that this is the greatest event of all time, but that this event involves you. This event involves you to make a decision on whether or not you want eternal life or not. This resurrection is for you and you need it. First reason why the resurrection is the greatest event of all time is because it is an event that involves the greatest divine activity. Let's read verse 1 and 7. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was in Galilee saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Now I know what some of you guys may be thinking when I say the resurrection is the greatest divine activity of all time. You may think, well, what about when God created the heavens and the earth and everything in between it? Isn't that the greatest divine activity? What about the virgin birth, the incarnation of Christ? Isn't that the greatest divine activity? What about the death of Christ? Isn't that the greatest divine activity? Those are important, essential to our faith. But understand, the resurrection really substantiates or proves that our faith is real. Okay, if there wasn't no resurrection, our faith would be false. All right, so all those are important aspects of the gospel. But remember, the resurrection is the foundation of our faith. We see here on the first day of the week at early dawn, they, who said they, skip down to verse 10 in chapter 24. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, also the other woman with them were telling these things to the apostles. And if you go back to Luke chapter 23, verse 49, it says, And all his acquaintances and the woman who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance seeing these things. That's referring to the death of Christ when he was on the cross. So we see here that these are women. Now you can do an in-depth study on each of these women. But I just want to show here that these are bold women who stayed with Christ while he was taken away crucified, and they were the first to come to his tomb. Now, in the other gospel accounts, it doesn't go this specific on who was there, but here in Luke, he mentions a lot of women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James. Some of the other gospel accounts, they just say Mary Magdalene. Some of them just say Mary and Magdalene. Some of them mention a woman named Salome. Okay, but it was probably a good group of women. Now, were they expecting a resurrected Christ? No. Okay, that's why they brought the spices over, right? In Mark 16, it, it, he clearly says that the reason why they came is to anoint the body. Anoint the body so that it won't have this stench odor. So they were surprised. They were surprised to see that their Lord was not there. 
How did this happen? I mean, there were guards there. There's a whole huge, big, giant, like, roll of stone, a stone covering the entrance of Jesus' tomb. This was a divine event. Nothing can explain this. The disciples left. They were cowardly. They're not bold enough to somehow fight the guards. They're not strong enough to move the big old stone away. So the women were perplexed. They were confused. They, were, they didn't know what was going on. They were triggered. Not only that, but the angels appeared to them. And they were probably terrified. The other account said that when the angels appeared, there was an earthquake. And then they, they made the guards fall like dead men. They were probably terrified of all these things, but the message the angel gave to the woman was good news. He says, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. The resurrection was an unexpected event, perhaps for many. The disciples and perhaps these women, they did not understand the Old Testament scriptures regarding Jesus' resurrection. Perhaps they didn't, they didn't understand what Jesus was saying many times before about he will die and rise again. This is a divine event because it is unexplainable from a human standpoint to see how there is an empty tomb. This is a divine event because it is God's sovereign, sovereignty being shown. It confirms the Old Testament prophecies. It confirms what Jesus said many times throughout his earthly ministry. This is a divine event because it is a dis display of the power of the triune God. This was a Trinitarian act, meaning that each person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all took part in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Je Jesus said in John 10, 17 and 18 that he has power and authority to lay down his life and raise it up. In John eleven twenty five, 25, he also says, I am the resurrection and the life. All throughout the New Testament, it talks about, the writers talk about how God raised Jesus from the grave. Acts 2.32 is one example of that. And then also the Holy Spirit is taught that he rose Jesus from the grave, like in Romans 8.11. Just like with the creation of the world, just like in salvation, just like in our sanctification, the Trinity is involved. The same way the Trinity is involved in the resurrection, all three members take part in this divine activity. And that is one, the, one reason why the resurrection is the greatest activity of all time, greatest event of all time, because it is a divine act. Second reason why the resurrection is the greatest event of all time is because it is an event that affirmed Jesus' identity. Let's go back to chapter 24, verse 6. And these are the angels talking. He said, He is not here. But he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. The greatest event, of course, has to involve the greatest man that ever lived, Jesus Christ. But this event affirms all the teachings that Jesus said regarding who he said he was. Think about all the I am statements. This event affirms that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh. The angel tells the woman, Jesus is not here, but is risen. He is living. But he also tells the woman, remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. Saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified in the third day rise. The angel is affirming the prophetic words of Jesus. Jesus prophesied of his death. His burial and resurrections numerous times. I'm only going to share two verses in Luke. Luke 9, 22, Jesus says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Luke 18, 31 to 33, Jesus says to his 12 disciples, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. And these prophecies came to pass, not just regarding his sufferings, not just regarding his death, not just regarding his burial, but his resurrection as well. Know how the angel tells the women to remember the words of Jesus. This should remind us that the greatest proof of the resurrection really is 
the teachings and the sayings of Jesus Christ. All the fulfilled prophecies. You have to believe in what he said. Because all the things that he said came to pass. Know that if Jesus did not resurrect, he is still dead. And if that's true, and all the things that Jesus said is true, Jesus will be a false prophet. And if he was a false prophet, he's a liar. And if he's a liar, he's a sinner. And if he's a sinner, he's not who he says he was, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. He's not God in the flesh. But Jesus did rise from the grave. Affirming that he is who he said he was. That he lived the perfect life. Being that perfect sacrifice to God for us. Taking all the wrath that we deserve from God and putting it, putting it on himself on the cross. The resurrection is like the stamp of approval of the sacrifice Jesus made for us. The resurrection affirms that Jesus is the true Lord and Savior. This is one of the reasons why the resurrection is the greatest event of all time, because it affirms Jesus' identity. Third reason why the resurrection is the greatest event of all time is because it is an event that continues to impact many. Let's start at verse 8. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James, also the other woman with them, were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Now, with any big, important event, most of the times there are conspiracy theories surrounding it. There are like doubts about it, or there's like some type of issue surrounding it. Like today, there are people who deny certain facts. Even though there's a lot of historical evidence, people will deny it or reject it for whatever reason. There are people who believe that the Holocaust was a hoax. There are people who deny that the world is a globe, or that, what are some other conspiracy theories? That, that people didn't walk on the moon. Or that the moon doesn't exist, actually. There's even conspiracy theories surrounding that. There are conspiracy theories who people believe that germs and bacteria aren't real. That it's just taught to control the masses or make people scared. And some people will even say AIDS and HIV isn't a real thing. Now, there are conspiracy theories that are quite bizarre, of course. There are some that may have hints of truth in it. There are some that may be true. And there are a lot of conspiracy theories surrounding the resurrection. And to deny and reject the resurrection is a heavy and weighty matter. Because this isn't just a historical event. This involves our spiritual lives. This involves our souls. You don't want to play and just deny or just act like the resurrection is not a big deal. This is something important. In Matthew 28, there's an account of the guards trying to make a conspiracy regarding the resurrection, saying that, oh, the, the disciples stole the body, trying to cover themselves up. And people still believe that, actually. There are people who believe that the disciples just made the resurrection up for whatever reason. They just wanted to gain power. Okay, I don't see why the disciples would do all that, because they all died for what they believe in. Usually when people know, if they know that something is a lie, they won't go that far and just say, oh, he's martyred me. All right? And usually when people want to gain power, usually money is involved or sex or power, of course. But the disciples didn't gain any of that. All right. What they had was suffering and persecution, death for their faith. The reality is that all the theories surrounding the resurrection actually reveal how people ultimately do not want the resurrection to be real because of their moral reasons. Not logical, not factual, not historical. It's a spiritual reason. It's a heart issue. We see some of these examples here, some of these responses here. The resurrection is one of the most, although it's one of the greatest events of all time, it is the greatest event of all time. It's probably the most polarizing event of all time as well because it really strikes people emotionally. Some are 
blatantly against the gospel for whatever reason that's some weird obsession with bashing christianity and the resurrection and the life of christ some outright rejected some um like m many christians really understand the importance of the resurrection we understand the need for the resurrection we really ad admire what christ did for us we love christ for what he did he died and rose from the grave from us and some are just ignorant of it but we see here the woman responded here in faith verse 8 and they remembered his words they went from being perplexed to being bold women who brought the good news to the apostles it is interesting to note too that the first evangelist of the risen Christ were women. That's one of the proofs of the resurrection as well, because back then women were seen as inferior to men. So you would think that if this was made up, women weren't be the ones to start this whole thing, really. All right. Not only that, if the disciples made this up, would they really make themselves seem like cowards or have lack of faith and things like that? All right, so the women responded in faith. They became bold women, and they told the apostles. But when they told the apostles, the apostles thought this was nonsense. This doesn't make any sense. All right, I, they, they didn't believe this. Now, what's interesting, though, is that Luke refers to this, the, the disciples here, the 11, because remember, it was 12 when Judas betrayed Jesus. The 11 are referred to as apostles here. Now, this is the only time that in the gospel accounts the word apostles is here, but Luke is really just revealing that eventually these people will believe. What is an apostle? Someone who's seen the risen Christ, who was sent out by Jesus Christ to be an ambassador for him. Okay? So do apostles exist today? No, okay? Because I know some of you guys got Church of God in Christ in you or an apostolic church in you. When you go to your grandmother's church or your auntie's church, they got apostles here. It's like, hey, what's going on here, you know? But really, really technically apostles don't exist, okay? The apostles were the 11 and, well, the 12 later on in Acts, there's Matthias. And then you have Paul, who is the unique apostle who had a um, road to Damascus revelation of Christ. But you see, Peter, he responded by going to the tombs. Like, okay, he ran to the tomb in the John account. John went with him, but here he only talks about Peter. He went to the tomb. He didn't find anything. He didn't find the body of Jesus Christ, and he went back home marvel. He was in wonder. He was amazed. That doesn't necessarily mean he believed that Jesus rose from the grave at that moment, but he was astonished. He wondered, like, wow, you know, what, what's going on? Now, perhaps right now today... You're sitting here. You probably heard the resurrection narrative before. Maybe this is your first time hearing it, and you're at the state where you think this is nonsense. You think this is a fable. You think this is a myth. You think there's some conspiracy theory around it. I want to challenge you, all right? You may have to be like Peter and dig in. Now, of course, you can't go to an empty tomb like Peter and find some linen wrappings and all that stuff. But what could you do? Perhaps you could look at the life of believers and see the transformed lives. You could look at the, the, um, the testimonies of their lives. I challenge you to read the Bible. Read the gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four testimonies of the resurrection and life of Christ. See the harmony in it. See what it means for you. See how you, how you need this. You can also see how the disciples really transformed from this event in the book of Acts. You can see in, see in Acts also how God changed a persecutor of, a ch of the church, a murderer, Apostle Paul, how he transformed him, changed his life, and he wrote the majority of the New Testament. You can read in 1 Corinthians how there are over 500 witnesses. I don't need to go to these secondary sources outside the Bible to prove that the resurrection exists. You can if you want to, but the primary source is to look at the Word of God and do like what the angels told Mary and all the other women to do. Remember the words Jesus spoke to you while you were in Galilee. Remember what he said about him dying and about him being risen again. That's what we have to do if you really want to search the truth. You can look at the church today. You can look at how the gospel impacts many people's lives today and how it transforms people. But the ideal thing is to look at the words of Jesus. 
This is why the resurrection is the greatest event of all time because it impacts people from at this point when the disciples, when the woman saw the risen Lord, which you can read later on, to now. It continues to impact many, either positively, where you will have eternal life, you accept the truth of the risen Lord, or negatively, and just judgment, condemnation awaits you. Because you have a sin issue, like we all do. And you have to do something about that. What could you do? Well, you can't do anything about it. Because God's standard is perfection. None of us are perfect, but we all deserve eternal punishment for our sins. But Good Friday happened, right? The death of Christ happened. But it doesn't just end there because guess what? Good Friday wouldn't mean anything if Jesus didn't rise from the grave. The New Testament wouldn't exist if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the grave. Did you know that? The resurrection shows that Jesus conquered the grave for us, defeated the power of death and evil making a way for us. And this is why, Christians, we must present the gospel. And when we present the gospel, we must present the resurrection. I'm guilty of this many times where I came to even pulpits or when I evangelized to people, um, like family, friends, whoever, and I mentioned how we're all sinners and God is holy and um, God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. And I just end it there. Sounds good, though, doesn't it? Okay, but what's, what's missing? The resurrection, okay? What if someone hears, okay, so someone died, you know, where's he at now? What does that mean? You know, that don't mean anything. Okay, that's like having, you know, a burrito with no tortilla, okay? Is it, is, is it, is it still a burrito? Is the gospel still the gospel without the resurrection? Ugh, it's incomplete, you know? Um, so I know we mess up on that. I do too um, sometimes, and I have before I know. Um, but I want you guys to really cherish this. If you don't know the Lord, if you don't know the importance of the gospel, if you don't, if this is your first time here in the resurrection, there'll be people here to talk with you. I could talk with you. I want you to understand and grasp this, understand that you need the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to make a way for us through, the, through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection. I want to pray for those who may have heard this message before but have not responded in faith to you. I also want to pray for those who, um, this may be their first time hearing this message, this resurrection narrative. Pray that they understand that they need you. They need your son, Jesus Christ. They need to understand that you love them and that you want, to, you want them into your kingdom. You want to have a relationship with them, Lord. And you don't desire anyone to perish. You want all to come to you, Lord. Pray that they understand that they're sinners, but that you love them. And you send Jesus Christ to die on the cross for their sins and rise on the third day to justify them, to make them innocent in your eyes. And that they can have a relationship with you while they're here on earth. And that they can have a relationship with you for eternity. And I want to pray for those who are already saved, who are already know about the resurrection, who have been impacted and transformed by the resurrection of Christ. May you give them grace as well to really persevere in this life, in their walk with you. May they grow in holiness. May they uh, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to those around them and to this community. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.